Hello, everybody, and welcome again to yet another OpenShift Commons briefing. And this time, I'm really pleased to have Aqua with us. Um, they are brand new members to the OpenShift Commons. Um, and as I always like to do is make new members introduce themselves and what they do in the um, ecosystem of OpenShift and Kubernetes. And these guys um, and folks were at the KubeCon event in Berlin, and I was pretty impressed with their offering, and then they joined up to the Commons, and so I was even more happy to um, have them as part of our uh, our community. So today, Tevi, um, or Tevi, Corin is going to do the presentation. We also have one other uh, person, Apesh Patel, who's in um, online as well with us, and we're gonna let them introduce themselves and give a presentation for about 30 minutes or so, and we'll have some Q&A afterwards. So, um, Sevi, take it away. All right. Uh, hi, everybody. Uh, really excited to be, uh, to be presenting here to the, to the community. Uh, you know, we've been uh, uh, in, the, in the Docker community for, uh, for a while now as a company. Uh, and I can actually jump right in uh, a little bit about about Aqua. So, so Aqua has, has been uh, was founded uh, about two years ago. Um, our mission statement is to make uh, the use of containers uh, be as secure as possible, and actually uh, provide organizations with the expertise and the, the tools that they need in order to uh, not have security as a uh, 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 something that would prevent containers from rolling out. So, so not not having security as a barrier for for containers. Um, our product, what we what we sell and what we support, uh, has been around for a year. Uh, has been used in, uh, in in multiple environments, both big and small. And um, and and I'm happy to share some of the uh, the product uh, details with you today. Um, we're also very much engaged in the community. So uh, we are an OpenShift uh, community member. We are. A private partner for OpenShift. You can find that information on, on the partner uh, section in, in OpenShift. Uh, we do a lot of meetups. Uh, we do a lot of conferences, uh, and uh, and we have uh, a lot of engagement with uh, companies and also with individuals that want to advance the cause of containers uh, and make sure that they are uh, done uh, securely in in an environment. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, so I actually come from the security side. Uh, I um, I've been in security for uh, you know over 20 years now, uh, and um, my focus is compliance, security processes, procedures, uh, and um, in the last uh, two and a half years or so, uh, I've been concentrating on uh, securing DevOps, uh, specifically containers, and doing a lot of advocacy for container uh, security. Uh, and um, and with me is Upesh Patel, who is uh, uh, doing. Uh, our community outreach and, and business development for Aqua, and, and he was uh, uh, the one that uh, was able to uh, get us uh, certified and uh, and on board on the community and, and, and make sure that we have the right relationships uh, with the entire e ecosystem. Uh, so what I'd like to do is jump a little bit into uh, what what we're doing today, and that is talk about security for, for containers. And it's, it's a pretty big subject. Uh, security for containers touches a lot of things. Uh, the way that containers touch a lot of things, uh, it's, a, it's a new paradigm in IT, and uh, and it turns things a little bit on their head. Uh, the the security that we've had so far around application development, the operations of application deployment, and the networks um, really didn't have a lot of interface points. And I show up, I show a few of the interface uh, points. Uh, firewalls and, and, and web application firewalls specifically are interfacing between the needs of the application, the needs of the network. Uh, the, the way that code is assessed and analyzed throughout the environment is interfacing with development and operations. And of course, there's the networking and operations for server config and patches. And containers right sit in the middle of it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, capabilities in containers. They shorten the development life cycles and they do uh, provide an opportunity to uh, roll the same software on, in multiple places and the flexibility to, to move to the cloud in, in, in a very uh, robust way. Uh, but for security, um, that fact that it really sits at the heart of very different, sometimes very disparate security practices uh, requires attention. And, and, it, and it has been a barrier to adoption because uh, it does turn the security processes um, 
from being very, very much late in the security process, in the development process, into something that needs to be thought in advance, and, and there needs to be a lot of collaboration between development ops and, and, and security. So this is where we sit today. Uh, containers are changing a lot of the security process and IT process in general, and we need to make sure that we, we follow up with them. Um, the platform security and where OpenShift comes in is to provide the best secure platform for running containers from an operational point of view. So by controlling who can access the nodes, by controlling authorization uh, around what uh, application spaces can be started, around what the, uh, the different users can do, the administrative rights, around um, making sure that container resources are done properly, that the server is hardened up front, uh, that there is element of intrusion detections and process separation. And that's actually just a partial list of all the, the security benefits that OpenShift provides. And, and it really cuts across both the operational and the network side. So what that allows us to do as people who want to run applications in containers is really not think about the, the stuff that we used to think about, which is how do we harden an operating system? How do we make sure that we have consistency in the administrative rights? How do we make sure that, that once we put a server out there, it doesn't really change over time and, and might introduce security risks that, that were not initially there? So OpenShift and, and admittedly also other container platforms, but OpenShift in general is very much security focused, uh, doing a lot of good work for, uh, for making sure that the uh, uh, defaults of Docker that, that may not be as secure are actually addressed, and, uh, and it really gives uh, confidence to actually run the platform. But that's just one side. That's just the platform. The applications themselves are still the applications. Organizations still develop applications in containers, and that code has nothing to do with Dockers or Red Hat or, or Kubernetes or anything that, that the, config, the, the configuration of the platform can address. The applications are still applications. And you know, 80, 90% of the code that is going to run in a containerized environment is not going to be the, the, the platform, but is actually going to be the payload that does the business uh, purpose for, for the application. And in that respect, security still has some concerns. Um, the prepackaged images, the things that go out of the development world and then being put on a particular server or a particular node through a deployment, um, is not well understood. There's, there's not a lot of transparency in the way that applications uh, are written in, in containers, especially the way that they are put together with the operating system. Uh, and uh, that creates a lot of uneasiness to security operations because they just don't feel that they have control. And that, that feeling is because they really don't know where security fits in the process. Security has very, very um, um, good history in being at the junction where applications get put on servers and that everything can be, uh, can be uh, assessed and, and the risk can be understood. Uh, but now that we're not building servers anymore, there's really nothing for security to, to hang on to. So that, that, that's a problem. Um, containers, uh, even Kubernetes itself, can provide a lot of operational views into containers, but not a lot of security views into containers. So the, the traditional security tools that are being used to view the environment, to assess the risk of the environment, are not in use. And then because uh, there's a lot of open source uh, usage, um, some of it uh, being uh, uh, assembled as a platform uh, like OpenShift, some of it can be uh, uh, in, instantiated uh, just as an open source component, that also creates an easiness for, for security. Um, I'd like to be able to point a little bit about you know, the process because in the pre-container world, um, you used to basically build your code and that's the top line there. You can do some static analysis, evaluate the code, make sure that coding practices are in place and then you would compile a, a package or a, a, a component that can then be run on a server that was provisioned beforehand. So somebody would provision a server, configure all the necessary operating system, they would put you know, Java on it if that's the case, they would put uh, the application server on it if that's the case, any type of middleware that is required, assess the risk, correct it, configure it properly, and then these two things get married and then deployed. And after that deployment is done, there is still an opportunity to then uh, take a look at the configuration security and, and other security parameters for, uh, for servers and then fix them while uh, the server is, is in production. Containers work very differently. And in the container world, the coding and static analysis still should happen, right? We are talking about applications that are still written 
uh, in, um, in programming languages that can benefit from static analysis. Uh, code still needs to be, to be compiled. Uh, but then, when building an image, when doing a Docker build, uh, this is where the risk assessment comes into play. It can't be done later in the process. Because once a container is instantiated, once the deployment is started, once pods are uh, instantiated uh, in, the, in the Kubernetes environment, it becomes um, almost impossible to patch them. And we really shouldn't, because containers really should not be touched after they're, they're rolled out. So what we're doing is we're now moving security from the very end of the process into the kind of beginning middle of the process. And that represents a change, and that represents a change that needs to have both the procedural and process and communication um, practices in an organization to support it, but it also requires some software solution that can provide the right visibility into where the process is. So what are we actually doing about it? And what is Aqua doing about it? And why, why, why are we educating the market in order to embrace containers? Well, we want to uh, answer the, the needs of security people uh, and, and make them feel comfortable with deployments of containers. So what do security people want? They want safe images from trusted sources, images that can't be tampered with, images that we, we know what the components are, um, common security practices, like all the things that OpenShift can do, making sure that uh, uh, no uh, out-of-band change can happen to the environment, that there is right authorization, network segmentation to make sure that whatever sensitive data you have is still segmented, still segregated, and safeguarded. Uh, anything that we need to do in an environment, container or not, especially if it's a regulated in-scope environment, needs to be audited so that we can find root cause analysis, but just provide the data for demonstrating compliance. A lot of the rules for security, and I know if you're coming from the DevOps side, seem arbitrary, uh, but that's the universe we live in. Uh, a lot of times you just need to provide data for compliance because you need to provide that, that data. So all of these have been developed over the years to support the uh, server environment, the VM environment, and the same process actually happened when we moved from physical servers to, to virtual machines. All these questions needed to be answered, and it took a little time for security people to, to come on board. And this is where we are with containers. But we want to accelerate that process, and we want to make sure that we give security people and DevOps people as well uh, the tools uh, in order to adopt containers in a uh, secure way. So there is an opportunity to actually change the way that security is done. Um, security could benefit from the shift left, which I hope I don't need to explain. This is where a lot of the processes are, are, are shifting towards the development side. Uh, we want to make sure that there is automation in place so that uh, whatever automation is done by the orchestration uh, or anything around it, uh, security can also benefit from. And we also want to be more preventative. Uh, and there's a chance because containers are microservices uh, to be a lot more uh, proactive, a lot more defined in the way that we do our security. And the way that we actually insert that into, into the process is to start to look at the kind of classic phases of the container lifecycle and figure out what security uh, processes and what security controls need to be done in each and every step. And at a very high level, and this is a very incomplete list, but at a very high level, when you build a container, when you, when you do a Docker build, um, make sure that the code is, is done right, make sure that you, we have a good understanding of what goes into the image. Uh, it starts from the from line, really understanding what the base image is and, and, and then understand uh, what other components will be built on it all the way to the payload of the application. Uh, as containers are promoted from environment to environment or also uh, uh, in the pipeline, um, we need to make sure that our assessment is still valid. So preventing any change or tampering with an image uh, is something that uh, will need to be done all the way up to the rollout to the nodes. Um, when we deploy to the nodes, uh, the nodes themselves are our operating system. They don't have as, med as many components as, as operating systems that, that basically carry payloads of complete applications, but there is still, you know, a lot of times an SSH service out there. There is still uh, the ability to run operating system uh, commands. The Docker group is still valid, even in a Kubernetes environment. So the access controls, uh, both to the physical node, but also to the Docker engine itself, are important. And then when, when containers run, um, we need to make sure that uh, they are running in line with their business purpose. And this is where we can insert a lot more of the, 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 the security control. So what I'd like to do is kind of dive into each of those, those areas uh, from an application security point of view um, and mention how 
well we can execute them in a OpenShift Kubernetes environment, but, but also in a natural Docker environment, uh, the same things really, really need to happen. Uh, what OpenShift is helping us with is, is by providing a lot of the controls that uh, Docker doesn't provide by default and, and making them available. So the first thing after a, 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 actually before an image is built, is to figure out where, where the image is coming from and how do we want to, to build it. So by, by selectively um, designing the build process of a, of a container image, um, we need to make sure that the, the images are secure, that the base images are secure, that whatever we're building on is something that is not going to bring with it a, a set of vulnerabilities or a set of configurations that is not in line with the best practices of the organization. Um, we want to make sure that we register uh, those images uh, so that only approved base images can be used, uh, scan vulnerabilities on the entire environment, share information between development, SEC, and ops, and basically uh, get a good visibility into the entire system. Uh, if we get good visibility, if we're transparent, um, then we have a much big, better chance of that environment uh, being seen as secure and being seen as something that uh, security feels, feels comfortable with. So on that note, uh, it really all starts with the development. So let, let's go into a uh, an environment, and um, you've probably seen that before. This is Jenkins. Uh, Jenkins is a, um, is a CI tool that's basically drive the, the steps in which an application is, is done. And um, there is a way to, with Aqua to provide a service that those processes, the CI processes, or actually anybody else, can ping and, and get an instant assessment of, of an image. So this is a, a build that was done uh, in Jenkins. And um, this build uh, basically starts with the pull of the base image. So this is the base image that, that we're pulling. Um, we are then running a, uh, the Aqua client container called Scanner CLI um, to uh, do an assessment on the base image, make sure that it complies with policy and, and make sure that it's registered uh, as something that is approved for use. Um, we are now collecting all those packages uh, that um, uh, that was in the base image, and we can uh, provide uh, information if the base if the base image is is okay to use. In this case, it is. We are then uh, doing the build, so that's pretty normal. We're doing the build. We are uh, um, copying some files. This is not a very robust build, but actually we're copying some files, um, installing nginx, uh, putting in the nginx command, and so on, building the the server. Uh, I'm actually pushing it into the registry. Uh, and then we're going to do an assessment on it. And you can do the reverse. You can also uh, uh, you know, do the assessment first and then decide if you want to push it through the registry. This is just for the purposes of, of my demo because I need to use that image later. So that, um, that image assessment is now taking place on both the base image and the entire stack. And, and we're getting a response. And the response is, unfortunately, that this image is disallowed. And we're also saying that we're going to prevent this image from running. Um, which is something that we need to remember because we're going to show how that's done. So right now we have a build. That build failed for a security purpose. Uh, okay, why, right? As a developer or ops person, you kind of ask yourself. And, and we are providing that answer. So we are providing a, uh, an output that is going to tell you exactly why this failed. This is a, this is a, a CVE, a block CVE, that, um, uh, that is too high for the purposes of the policy. Uh, and therefore, we want to make sure that if we can avoid using this component, or uh, or maybe uh, change this component, or update it to a new to a new version, uh, this vulnerability is not going to be there, and then uh, the the image will uh, will will be allowed to uh, to continue. Uh, and that's exactly what I did. So my my version two of that image uh, is something that uh, has. Uh, I'm going to go to the build. Uh, something that has more or less the, the same thing, so getting the base image, scanning the base image, and so on, and then um, building the image, and now we're getting success. So um, this, is, this is not the end of the build, usually, because there are other things that need to be done, but for our purposes, this, this is where, where, where the build is, is finished successfully. And what we're doing is we're still providing that, that level of vulnerability, but right now we see that their scores are pretty low, and there's nothing there that violates the policy, and therefore the image is, is allowed to continue. Um, maybe somebody decided at one point to, to do a new build or experiment with uh, a, um, uh, building the same uh, environment or the same application 
on a, a different base operating system. So in this case, you know, I'm, I'm building it on Debian uh, and not, uh, uh, not Alpine. Uh, Debian, of course, has a different way of doing application. It comes with its own vulnerability sets and so on. But for my organization in, the, in this demo, uh, Debian is really not assessed, right? I don't know what that is. Security hasn't really evaluated it. It's really not authorized to be used as a base image. Um, and even though the build carries on, um, we're still disallowing the image. Uh, we're disallowing the image not because of a vulnerability, but because um, it's not, uh, it wasn't built on a trusted base. So even though it has the same amount of vulnerability as the image that uh, uh, provided, that, 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 uh, that, that was allowed to proceed uh, in version two, uh, version three may not have uh, a, a much bigger vulnerability posture, but it is something that security hasn't assessed yet. So we're not only dealing with vulnerabilities here, we're also dealing with the configuration and the base image uh, and, and assessing whether or not uh, that is acceptable for, for the organization. Uh, what I'd like to do is take a look at, at the aqua side of things. So this is what the CI side of things. In the aqua side of things, um, we have our uh, demo application here. Let me just sort it by alphabetically. Um, and we have um, the same information in the Aqua AI. So uh, demo number one is disallowed because of a CVE, two is okay, and three is disallowed because um, it's not using an, an approved base, base image. All of these actually uh, correspond to a, an image assurance policy that uh, can have many parameters, uh, but the ones that I chose to use in this demo is uh, the fact that there are some uh, vulnerabilities that should be uh, blocked uh, and that uh, um, these are the approved base images that uh, can be used in my environment. By the way, if I wanted to, if I, if I, I, I build it on Debian with if I use Debian Jesse, that build would have been successful because that is an approved base image, right? So sometimes it's not really the type of the operating system, but security may be a little bit behind in assessing the um, uh, compatibility of newer versions of DOS uh, as a um, as a good base, and and that just takes time because security needs some time to do their work. Uh, that's something that organizations will need to negotiate and make sure that we have the right uh, versions in place. So this is the the the, the image policy, and that's why we have um, the uh, some of the uh, uh, tags available to use, uh, and some are not. Uh, Another thing that, that we're providing with Aqua is, is some information that uh, ops and security might want to know about the image as a whole. So it's not just that the vulnerability posture is here and we can take a look uh, and we'll see in a little bit the, the, the vulnerabilities and, and, what they're, um, and what information we get on them. But just the packages that are deployed in that image, uh, some of the metadata about this image, so if you remember, you know, we, we were using Nginx, so just knowing what the command is, is probably going to put a lot of people at ease because once you instantiate an image, you really don't know what it's going to run. Um, so that's, that's the, the, the one thing that we can uh, provide security and, and make sure that they have the right uh, authorization for. As far as the vulnerability posture, uh, there needs to be a lot of information passed along back to development in order to know uh, what to do. And, and, and in, in Aqua, we are um, doing a lot of work to provide good understanding of what the uh, vulnerability is and what might be the impact. And you can see that we have several uh, types of vulnerabilities. Actually, CV is just one of them. So um, we are using white source as, as our, um, one of our sources for code that, uh, that is not really operating system based, but really some package based. So, uh, and we can give you some fixed solutions and advice on how to uh, address them. Uh, we are correlating the Red Hat vulnerabilities with the NVD vulnerabilities. So if you know how to read the NVD, uh, those are the common uh, vulnerabilities that have been uh, kind of pushed up to uh, the, the national database, even though Red Hat may have a different view of them. Um, and again, we're providing description, fixed version, and, and the solution advice, and we can link back to the NVD and also to Red Hat, uh, so that every time that you develop on, on a Red Hat or CentOS-based image, uh, you have the ability to uh, get a good understanding of what not only is 
uh, is the, the, the NVD thing of the vulnerability, but whether or not Red Hat agrees. And, uh, and Red Hat is actually doing a lot of good work in order to assess the security of, of the tools here. Um, so here we have another vulnerabilities where um, um, there is correlation between, between Red Hat and, and the CVEs. Uh, something to, to kind of make a note is that sometimes um, there are vulnerabilities that uh, there's no agreement on, and, and there's not a lot of agreement in the vulnerability space sometimes. So what we have at Aqua is we, we've done the work to address some of those things that are um, negligible and may not be um, uh, something that you need to worry about. And in this case, um, the, if you scan it with, uh, with basically any, any type of vulnerability scanner, this will go to, is going to pop up on this version of Bash. But you know, Red Hat no longer considers this to be a security issue because there are maybe other factors that, that mitigate it. So uh, um, that is something that, uh, as a development organization uh, or as, as ops, you may not know the exact impact of a particular vulnerability. That's why we need to have collaboration between DevOps and security to just make sure that we, we are on the same page. Uh, but we are arming you with a lot of information in order to uh, make the argument that if you do need to use a component, uh, then, then you can use a component and you can allow it to uh, and you can allow it to run in your environment. So at the end of the day, we want our, our images to be uh, secure. So we want to get an agreement that an image is, is okay to run. Uh, we can um, put those rules in the CI. We have the information that allows us to then collaborate with security uh, and make that uh, determination. Um, but at the end of the day, the image is going to be uploaded to a registry and then should be available for use. And then what we're doing, we are going into the second phase, which is um, we also want to make our Docker engines uh, and our and OpenShift nodes only accept those known images, images that have been assessed and images that have uh, the security posture is known, uh, approve them based on the risk and also maintain the integrity of the image so that if somebody changes it or the name changes, um, we can uh, detect that and, and, and make sure that the image is um, uh, is is, is uh, proof for use b before we run it. So we have those three uh, demo images. Let's kind of run through that uh, pretty quickly. So um, what we can do is we can pull uh, our demo 1.0 image and try to run a container from it, and, and we get uh, the message that um, you know we don't have permission to execute it because this is an, an unauthorized image. So so demo 1.0. Uh, as you remember, is disallowed, and the message was, you know, we won't be able to run it, and that's that's how we won't be able to run it, and that's because Aqua is safeguarding the uh, the Docker uh, engine on a particular node and doesn't allow that uh, image to to instantiate. We can swap out the image name, right? Docker tag still works even even in a Kubernetes environment. Um, and, and as far as the Docker engine is concerned, you know, we have, you know, the 1.0 version and the 2.0 version. Uh, but if you try to run that 2.0 version, it still tells us that this is an, an unauthorized image. And the reason why we know that is in the course of assessing the security of an image and, and getting all the um, vulnerability information, uh, what Aqua is doing is it's actually doing a, a hash of the file system in all the individual file and then a complete digest of that image. And what we're doing is we are providing a state for each of those images. So a state can be either registered, it can be unregistered, uh, or it can be an invalid digest. And in this case, um, we have a, uh, our 1.0 image is registered, it's the same image, but it's blocked because it's disallowed. Uh, my 2.0 image actually looks very, very iffy, right? Because the, the server digest is one thing. We, we, we've looked at it before, but locally it, it, it doesn't look like we, what we expect and therefore we, we would block the, the, the running of it. Um, the only way really to run this image is to, to pull it again. And that's the 2.0 image and then we get our hello world and then that image becomes uh, registered. So. It's not only the ability to understand what the risk posture of an image in the pipeline, but we also need to have our engines, our nodes, 
um, only accept images uh, and deployments that are allowed uh, to use, and uh, we have the ability to then stop images that are not allowed to use or that uh, are different than what we, we, we expect them to. Um, one of the things that Aqua provides as a, as a compliance view is that we can do the same view across all the nodes, and this is my, my host images view, and, and, and you can see that there are, you know, a few of them are not like the others, right? Some of them are not registered, some of them are not registered and don't comply with policy. This is really not what we want to see. Uh, we want to see something that is uh, more in line with the rest of my server environment. You know, my number three server is probably the best uh, one because I didn't put anything un unauthorized on it. Uh, this is really what we want to see. We want to see that everything is registered and everything uh, c complies with, with, with the policy. Um, the same view, by the way, can be uh, done on, on containers. So uh, on every running container, um, we have the ability to uh, to see whether or not it complies the policy or it comes from a registered image. So this is the phase where uh, we're able to basically say that everything that we deploy, everything that we ship to a particular node is something that A, we expect, and B, has passed the organization's security policy, which should make everybody a lot more comfortable in what can run in the, the environment. In addition to that, the deployment can be done uh, a lot of times with automation. In a Kubernetes environment, it really should be done with automation. Um, but we want to separate automation from, from human action. So not allowing access to the node, uh, controlling who can gain privilege if you do allow access to the node, uh, make sure that we limit you know, what permissions, volumes, networks uh, can be used in the course of a deployment, and, and basically give you a lot of an audit trail. And that's another thing that, that Aqua can do because our ability is to audit everything that happens in the Docker engine itself. So this, this is the, the audit log from the last few minutes, and you can see that I had a, uh, a block because my demo two was, was disallowed. Uh, everything else is successful. So um, another thing, if you are uh, working in a Kubernetes environment, you expect the user context to be the user context of, of Kubernetes to do all the heavy lifting around changing and, and starting and stopping containers. Uh, so it's really easy to identify if there is a user, a named user, that is doing any of that work. And that, of course, can be funneled into a, uh, um, a log aggregator or a security information management platform and then takes from there and correlated with, with, with the rest of the environment. So preventative controls are great. Uh, the detective controls, the ability to see the logs, uh, is also very, very useful because it provides us with uh, the ability to then prove that our controls are, are working. And then we get to running containers themselves, right? So we've seen that the images are good enough to run because we've done a security assessment on them. We know that they haven't changed. We know that they are run by authorized uh, services or authorized people. Uh, but when a container is running, um, there is a lot of things that, that the container still can do, right? It's still running software. It's running software that's a lot of times um, exposed to incoming traffic, uh, and we want to make sure that our container is is run uh, really according to plan. So there's a few things that we want to make sure. We want to make sure that, that the user context that we run in the container is the right user context, that, that the executables are in line with what the container should do. We want to prevent any significant drift between the container and the image. Uh, because we really should not be patching or, or doing any changes to a container. And then we just want to understand what the usage data is. And that's not usage around resources, but really who's using what and, uh, and whether or not uh, there is any misuse of the container, basically an attempt to co-opt it to do something that it's not, uh, it, it is, it is not uh, supposed to do. So understanding all that, um, Aqua is really uh, providing those controls while a container is running. And, and one of the, the first things that we want to do is just kind of get a baseline on, on what a container is doing. So if we take a look at our, our list of images here, um, I have WordPress uh, as one of the images. And if I just start a, a WordPress instance, one of the things that, that happen is that uh, this WordPress instance, we are starting to get some telemetry from. So we are getting um, some usage information from it. 
Uh, we are getting all the executables that it was run, uh, that, that, that were run. And, and you can see that, you know, WordPress is a pretty heavy application. It does contain a lot of processing and web server. But even that, there may be, you know, uh, uh, 22 or, or something or 12 uh, 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 processes that, that, that need to run. Uh, we can understand what the networking requirements are, uh, if there are any environment variables that were passed along to the container, and what user accounts it's running on. This is actually a, not a very good image because it's running on the root. We want to make sure that, that that doesn't happen in production. But let's take a look at the resources right now. So now, now we have an idea of you know, when WordPress is running, really what it needs. Now, let's take a look at the image itself. The image itself, um, if we do, uh, let's say, a Docker exec um, into it, even as root, and uh, go into our container. Um, we can see that there's quite a lot of executables there. Um, it's actually not as bad as some of the other, you know, full operating system, but it's more than the application needs, right? So one of the things that we need to ask ourselves is, do we want to run, you know, every single executable just because it's in the image? Uh, but another very important question is, uh, do we want to allow those uh, executables to change? Right? So now I'm root inside of a, of a container. Um, you know, there's namespaces here, so I'm not root on the host. I really can't do a lot of damage on the host, but, but I can do uh, quite a few damage to the container, right? I, I, can, I can take, you know, ln, for instance, uh, which is a pretty innocent command, but I can do like a, a copy. Let's copy that to a, a, another executable. Um, or, you know, maybe download an executable or, or do something that is going to add some code to the container that was not found in the image, and, and let's try to run it. Well, we can't run it. Uh, and the reason why we can't run it is that um, one of the fundamental policies uh, in, in Aqua is to prevent drift between the container and its image. So one of the ways to uh, allow for uh, a more free usage of, of containers is to uh, limit what can be done to them once they're they're instantiated so even if I even if I change the itself right let's say let's copy ping to a len for instance so we could use a len while it was the right command now we can't use it so all of these things are designed to make sure that if, if a container is running and instantiated uh, there's very little that it, it can be exploited by, by that container, and that, that's called drift prevention. Uh, this is actually what allows us to then go back to our list of running containers and um, do some search, right? Let, let's, let's search for a vulnerability. Uh, we are able to search throughout the environment for a particular vulnerability um, and, and get all the containers that run from it. This is an instant impact analysis. Uh, we can go into the containers and, and look for a particular package or an executable and look at all of those that, that run Python. Uh, and this is relying on the fact that, you know, we know that the container is based on an image. We've already pre-assessed the image. We know the security posture of the image. We know the components of the image. And we're also preventing any addition uh, of executables that can be run um, from the um, internet or from anywhere else or even uh, something that was written as a script inside of the, of the container. So the idea is that in order to maintain that um, assurance that images are known, only known images can run, only containers can run from known images and they cannot change from the known images, allows us to have that assurance end to end that the images that we are running are indeed the ones that, that we expect and we can actually provide that search capabilities uh, bit, bit, between them. Um, once that happens, um, we can then, um, again, go back to the uh, list of executables and all the other resources that we found in a container. And I'm, I'm switching from WordPress to, uh, to, J, to JBoss now because it's a little bit of a shorter list. And we can actually make it into a more uh, complete profile. So this is a profile that, that is based on, uh, on, on uh, uh, JBoss. And, and we can see that the... Uh, uh, files for it are actually uh, just seven executables that, that it needs to run. Uh, we can add a lot more things to the profile. We can add um, uh, whether or not the container needs networking at all. Uh, if we can add uh, read-only uh, files, if there's a configuration file in the container that should not change, uh, we can control the executable list. Uh, we can control 
the uh, user context in the container, right? WordPress ran as root, JBoss is actually a little bit better. There is a user ID that, uh, that is specific to that. Um, this is the parameter that tells us not to run executables in the original image. Um, we are preventing running with privileges. Um, so this is in the case that a container instantiates as privilege outside of the OpenShift controls. Uh, and then um, we can add things like a SECOM profile, which can be a little bit more granular than SE Linux and can run per repository. Uh, we can drop capabilities, uh, control the volumes for the container, control the, the limits, again, um, um, in a way that is uh, complementary to what the uh, specifics are in the deployment uh, for that particular container. Uh, and we're getting to a situation where uh, a particular application can now be even more limited in how, how it can run. And th the way that we do that is that if we run our application uh, and, you know, we're going to supply some parameters to it uh, and we're going to uh, give it a name, give it a port and so on. So it, it's a little bit more um, in line with how a deployment would look like. Uh, but then let's try the same thing. Let's try to do a Docker exec um, and try to do basically what we did with WordPress. So this is my app and I want to run bash rate. And I'm getting a permission denied off the bat, and that's because you know, root is not an authorized user for this container. Root is something that uh, should be reserved uh, to uh, basically any, nothing, right? Really, a container should, should not be run at all with root. Uh, if, we, if we eliminate that, uh, what we're doing is we are uh, doing a um, failover to the user that is defined in the image, and that's the JBoss user. Uh, so now we are in the container. But you can see there's a bunch of permission denied there, and that's because you know anything else, you know, ping, ls, uh, ps, uh, curl, uh, is really not, really shouldn't run, right? Even though it's available inside of the operating system, it really shouldn't run. And the reason why it shouldn't run is because it's not in line with what this container is supposed to do. It's not in the list of authorized uh, ex executables. Um, in this case, this image is, 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 is not well built. Like if we, um, if we add, um, or let, let's say that we just move this to an audit only uh, and, and we save this. Um, now we do have LS uh, and um, it, the bin directory is just huge, right? There's a lot of stuff in there. So something that I probably should have mentioned in the beginning is that size really does matter, right? The smaller images uh, usually have less of an attack vector. This has a huge attack vector. Anything here can either have a vulnerability and can be exploited. So if you're using big images, which sometimes there's a reason to, uh, limiting the processes that can run to something that is only required for that image uh, is going to greatly improve our, 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 uh, the, the security posture of, of the entire environment. Um, so let's go back and uh, reapply my policy here. And, um, and let's take a look at, uh, at, at how we're actually passing parameters to, uh, to, to a container. So uh, sequence management is something that is uh, talked about a lot. I mean, in the last DockerCon, I must have had you know, 50 conversations on sequence management alone. Uh, and, and there are some... Uh, organizational issues with using the built-in secrets management inside of the, the, the orchestration tools. Not that they're not good, it's just that they don't play nice with the rest of the, the environment. So as an alternative to that, um, what, what Aqua is doing is we're using our capabilities to interface into containers uh, to provide some uh, aspect of secrets di distribution. Uh, and the way that we do that is that we have our Secret distribution on the front end, uh, and, uh, as far as the nodes are concerned, and our back end can be a variety of integrations. So it could be a HashiCorp Vault, it could be um, you know, the uh, Amazon Key Management Services, Azure Key Management Services, or, or maybe even our, our own internal database uh, that can provide those secrets, and, and they really live outside of the orchestration. Um, because security sometimes wants to control them, right? Orchestration may be a little bit too, too controlled by ops. So if you run our application, what we're seeing here is that we have our, um, uh, uh, a user here, which really should not be encrypted. We have a token here, um, which maybe should, not, should be encrypted. 
uh, and we have something that is coming from a, um, a vault somewhere. So if we do basically a Docker inspect uh, on my application, and let's do grep so we didn't get a big block here, um, you can see that the, the unencrypted is still unencrypted, that whatever is tokenized is still tokenized, and, and my token here is, 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 is encrypted, and we really can't see it anywhere outside of the, of the container. So where is this secret coming from? This secret is coming from, uh, in this case, the Aqua internal database. Uh, it could come from HashiCorp Vault. It could come from the, the key management stores. Um, and first of all, we get tracking of which container is using it. Uh, so that's really important because if that leaks out, we want to know the impact. Um, and, uh, and we can actually change the value. So we can you know, put here something, you know, OpenShift, um, and save the change. Uh, and that gets transmitted directly to the, the container. So if we go into the container and um, take a look using an exact command at, at the environment variables, um, we are getting uh, that, that value that is uh, being decrypted and handed off to, to the container. So that secrets management is something that can be done external to, to the orchestration. It can something that could be under the control of um, security and not ops. You can mix and match. Uh, so if there are secrets that are very, very operational in nature and you still want to keep them in Kubernetes and make sure that they're part of the system, you can still use them. If there are secrets that are more uh, corporate that need to be uh, put into a separate vault or there needs to be rotation uh, on them that is more automated, uh, then you have the ability to do it uh, with Aqua where, where Aqua is actually uh, d distributing that secret to, 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 to the environment. And everything that we've done so far is also audited. So uh, we audited uh, the fact that we've changed the secret, so that's important. Um, that's something that security really needs to know is whenever secrets are rotated. Um, we've seen all the Docker inspect and start commands. Um, we have did a lot of detection of the, the file execution. Uh, so this is where LS was, was permitted. Uh, this is where all the uh, file execution inside of the containers were blocked. And, and you can see the difference between the detect and the block. Uh, we're getting the actually original user. So this is me logging onto the container, uh, to the host, even though I did a lot of work inside of the container. So that's something that uh, uh, usually um, the, the compliance organization is interested in to, to figure out who did what in the environment. Um, but we're getting a lot of, of information. And really at, at the, the core of it is the notion that, that um, we have uh, the opportunity to do better security with containers. So if you have security people that are uh, resistant, please tell them that you know, containers are actually good for security and somebody who's been doing security for 20 years uh, is saying that. And that is that we can, we can do all of these capabilities. I'm not going to read them out loud, but, but these are the things that, um, uh, that are important for security and these are the things that we can execute in a containerized environment, which, re which should provide us with the ability to run meaningful workloads in scope applications uh, and applications that uh, are subject to regulations based on the security needs uh, of, of, of the organization. Um, so I hope this was beneficial. Uh, please visit aquasec.com. There's a lot of information there. Um, you can read some of our white papers. Uh, you can look at the OpenShift partner page to uh, uh, take a look at some of the uh, specific things that we do around OpenShift, but I'm gonna open it up for uh, questions if there are any. All right. Well, thank you very much, Sevi. This has been, it's been uh, really, I, I, I got the demo when we were at KubeCon, but I didn't go into this much depth. So I really appreciate it. It's great stuff that you guys are doing. There have been a, a couple of questions and um, I think what might be the easiest thing to do is if I unmute Peter, who's been asking most of those questions. And Peter, you're unmuted now. Um, why don't you go ahead, Peter, and try and, and, and frame your question, and I, and that should kick off some conversation. Sure. I mean, it's, it's, it's basically, I'm trying to figure out the scope of the scanning. Uh, a lot of the questions we get is about compliance, uh, and that's the concern. It's not just uh, the CVEs. But it's also, is this server actually allowable to go into production? Hence, is it following government standards for whatever security standards you have to apply? So that means that the scanner, when we do an OMS scan, for instance, is mostly interested in the configuration of the components that are running, not just that they are running on the right and the latest binaries and all that. 
but that they might not allow bad things. Uh, examples could be allowing root logins on SSH or SHA-1 or even 256 uh, for encryption, stuff that are all not allowed by, you know, it's, you know once you get up to a, just even a minimal level of security. So I was just wondering if those kind of files are included, anything from JBoss to the core OS or to Apache and so on, whether you are part of what you're evaluating are those configuration files. Yeah, so we are evaluating uh, the the makeup of the image in in, um, in addition to the file. So I didn't really go into the the policy, but but one of the things that you can do actually, and you said that is 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 you know um, uh, identify uh, uh, images that are where's that control right here. Identify images that are defaulting to run as root, right? So that's equivalent of the you know is root open to SSH on 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 a server. The configuration requirements are going to be a little bit different because containers really should not have direct access to them. Uh, but you're absolutely correct that the uh, both the vulnerability and the configuration uh, really needs to follow the guidelines of your server environment. So we're actually using this as a preview. Um, in the course of the next uh, couple of months, uh, we're going to release uh, a version that has uh, the ability to run uh, code snippets and, and, and script snippets to assess the security of, uh, of certain uh, elements of the operating system, uh, and also SCAP support. If you're using that, if you know how to use that language uh, to provide a structure that can be that we can, can assess the, the image against. And we definitely recognize the fact that vulnerabilities are not the end-all, be-all of the security posture, but the actually configuration of the image, uh, whether or not an SSH key was left in there, whether or not your web server is running under SSL. All these things are important questions, and we are adding those uh, to, to the image assessment part of, of the Aqua tool. Does that answer your question there, Peter? I think he's muted himself again. Yeah, I try to be nice and not make any noise. Yes, that answers my question. Thank you. <laughs> OK, perfect. And it, and it gives me a perfect way to segue. And we're going to have to have you guys back again um, when you get that next release out with those new functionalities um, to show, show off that as well. So um, keep us posted. Um, I just, we're almost to the end of the hour. And I don't see any other questions. I'm wondering if, um, if you have anything else you want to add, Sevi, or if uh, Apesh wants to butt in and ask any questions at all um, or answer. And I think that was, most of the questions got answered in the Q&A and they were um, questions that preceded things that you then um, explained in the slides and in the demo. So I think we, we did a pretty good job of covering everything off today. Uh, I had a quick question. So you, did you guys say that you are looking into um, doing the scanning for, uh, using um, SCAP and uh, an SCAP profile? So that's in the roadmap. Is that how, what I understood from the end, that end question? Uh, yeah. So so okay. the, the intention is to have a feature where you can either have a, a small shell script that checks for something or an SCAP expression that can check for that thing. Thanks. All right. And thanks for asking, Lucy. Anyone else have any questions? If not, um, you can always check these folks out on aquasec.com or jump on Slack. There's a couple of them that are in the Slack channel for OpenShift Commons or hit them up on the mailing list as well. So again, Sevi and Apesh, and I think Rainy was on there as well answering questions. Um, thanks very much. And we're really pleased to have you guys as members of the OpenShift Commons and look forward to hearing more from you in the future. Yeah, thanks, thanks very much, everybody.